but it seems to be kind of the most extreme example of changing these laws. So it's very subtle again, the slight change, but he says the necessities instead of food, sha'er. Sha'er is the Hebrew for food. And so the question is, what what, what is going on here? Why is this happening? In Hebrews 1, 6, you've got the author of Hebrews citing a text that says something that's not in our Old Testament. Everyone, this is what your pastor didn't tell you today. I'm on with Dr. Joel Koretko. We're going to be talking about weird translations in the Septuagint and how that could influence or even have a, give us a better understanding of Old, Te Old Testament law and Second Temple Judaism. How are you doing today, Dr. Koretko? Hey, Zach, I'm doing really great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. All right. Can you give us a little bit about your background on the topic as well as just education and current job and all that? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm working currently out of Trinity Western and Act Seminaries, particularly Northwest Baptist Seminary in uh, Canada, British Columbia, Canada. I live in Chilliwack, a little, well, I guess not so little anymore, but a kind of farm town for most of its history. And I am uh, particularly involved in Septuagint studies, my DPhil, Doctor of Philosophy, PhD, that's, that's what you call it overseas. Same thing as a PhD is from the University of Oxford which I finished my studies up there a little while ago. And before that, I was at Trinity Western, Act Seminaries again, doing my MTS, Masters of Theological Studies in Septuagint. And before that, I was at a little Bible college called Columbia Bible College in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Uh, currently, I, like I said, work in Septuagint studies formally in my publishing and academic writing. I am also an adjunct, adjunct instructor for Old Testament at Trinity Western. I also teach... Um, semi-regularly at ACT Seminaries or Northwest Baptist Seminary. I'm involved in CBTE, competency-based theological education for those who are working in ministry. And so I'm an academic mentor to some of them, uh, so to some of the students that are in that program. And I also work in curriculum development and other things related to the academic dean's office at Northwest Baptist Seminary. Awesome. And you have your uh, your monograph, which is currently in peer review. Well, this is what we're talking about today. So this would be a lot of fun. All right. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, monograph and peer review currently. And then uh, a commentary I'm working on with Larry Perkins for the Society of Biblical Literature commentary series on the Septuagint, it's Exodus. And then I've got another article coming out in a few months here, which I can't really talk about. Uh, and then uh, another article that is kind of the one that's kind of stirred things up a little bit with some people. Um, which is from uh, JSCS in 2021, uh, which was the Weaver's Prize article from the year prior. And we'll be talking about some of that today. Awesome. That's exciting to hear. Okay. So can you give us, um, so yeah, this, since this topic is primarily comparing Hebrew texts with the translation into the Greek text, Septuagint, can you give us a little background of what the Septuagint is in general? Yeah, sure. Well, first off, the Septuagint, it's its not a single translation. So it, there's a lot of kind of mystery and enigma behind this thing we call the Septuagint. But uh, usually it's its its stated that each book would have a, a different translator. Um, that's not entirely clear. Um, some books might have had singular, like the, the Minor Prophets seem to have had more of a translational unity and uh, perhaps sing, a single translator behind behind them. But um, the, the, this label, Sept Septuagint, it's, it's kind of controversial or controverted. Uh, Peter Williams, a little while ago, kind of had this video that was, I guess, viral in biblical studies, which means nothing in the actual world, <laughs> saying that he that uh, there's no such thing as a Septuagint. Because it, in, in reality, we're dealing with Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible. And there were some early translations and then some that came along after. And uh, that's that's really that they all get labeled this thing, the Septuagint, as if it's this monolithic whole, but in really it's disparate. It's a bunch of different things, a bunch of different translations, not necessarily happening at the same time. Um, that's not to say that there doesn't seem to be a kind of a, a core early on of where the Pentateuch was translated. And so it seems like the first five books of uh, the Old Testament of the Torah, um, th th these were probably translated sometime in the third century BCE. Uh, there's a story from, you ever heard of the letter of Aristeus before? No. Okay. So it's, there's this story. It's where the name Septuagint comes from. It's this uh, 
document from the second century that claims that uh, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, in the middle of the third century BCE, he had uh, 70 Jewish scholars, translators come in to, to Egypt um, under his uh, command through, I think it's Demetrius, uh, who is going to have all kind of the, the, the literature of the world translated. And so they, they, they bring in some, some, some Jewish scribes because of um, some contact there in Jerusalem with the high priest and whatnot. And uh, they all uh, separately come to the same translation. Of, of the Torah, of the Pentateuch. And that's this amazing miracle that happened in the translation of, of the, the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And so that's where this term Septuagint means 70. And so that's where that, that term comes from. But re in reality, people don't think that Aristeus is historically reliable. And, and I mean, that's already a huge claim, right? Some miraculous translation. And it does not seem like the, 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 the Pentateuch is a product of it really does seem like a product of different people, different translation styles, different um, potentially even agendas, uh, so and different audience, perhaps even audiences. It's it, we're, it a lot of this is still in uh, still up for debate. Um, yeah, so that's that's Septuagint. So to to make it clear, we're that's just a a title given to early Greek translations, particularly we're talking about the Pentateuch in the third century, and then later on in the second century, it seems like other books of the Old Testament come along as well. We don't really know who translated um, any of it. In reality, there are guesses and there are really internal clues are what you have to look for here. And so some of my work has kind of taken some stabs in the dark. Um, we'll be talking about kind of the, le the legal influence of uh, of the, the time uh, or the, the law at the time, which was Greco-Egyptian law. Where the Septuagint, the Pentateuch seems to be, as I said, in Egypt, translated in Egypt. And so uh, perhaps there's some legal knowledge or legal training on the, on the translator of Exodus, but by and large, there's we're not particularly certain uh, what they did or who they were, uh, and we don't even know how long it took, um, how many edits, anything like that. And even a book like Exodus, the one that I work in particularly, that would be very difficult to to get through in any short pe period of time. So it's probably a lot of work. I think there's some editorial stuff going on. Does does that help? With what you you're asking? Oh, totally. Um, how do we know that like it was even written in the second century? Uh, sorry, I said third century for okay. the Pentateuch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have other sources um, which reference the Greek translation, and so there are historians um, who uh, at the end who we have dated to the, you know the end of the third century or early second century who will cite the Septuagint version. We have is like for uh, we have uh, literary sources, for example, Ezekiel, the tragedians, uh, Exegog, Exegoge, um, which is kind of this retelling of the story of Moses, and uh, it's using you can tell it's in Greek and it's it's basing itself off of the Septuagint version version of Exodus, and so we have these little historical clues and document um, kind of. Um, breadcrumbs that we're following to go back and see oh okay it must have had it must have come about before this because we're seeing it influencing the around the culture around we also have manuscript russian uh i guess yeah some manuscript evidence of like deuteronomy in the second century in its greek version and then we also see the septuagint version being drawn on um in some legal disputes in the middle of the second century BC. So it clearly had made its way around so that it was being used in, in legal disputes among Jews in Egypt. So there's a, there's a host of things and they all point us towards at least that kernel of truth being there in Aristeus, which is that the Septuagint Pentateuch uh, seems to have come about in the century prior. Fascinating. Okay. So, uh, you know, obviously it's, you know, it's a, it's a Greek translation, but it's like, you know, what would be the importance of, you know, even looking at that, like, why can't we just look at the Hebrew? Yeah, it's a good question. Why not just the Hebrew? Well, I mean, anyone who's interested in biblical studies probably is interested in the New Testament. And when you open up your New Testament and you start reading, you're going to come across, oh, uh, as it is written, or thus said Isaiah or something like that. And most of the time, and I, I I don't have an exact number on me, I, I would ballpark at 90% or something like that. Um, the citations are going back to this 
Septuagint translation, this early translation. Um, and so the New Testament authors are relying not on the Hebrew text the majority of the time, it seems, but rather this particular translation. It's almost, um, it's, it's, it's become it's become incredibly popular and it's spread throughout the Mediterranean and it seems to be the Bible of many um, Jews in the diaspora. So Jews who had gone out of uh, Israel um, and Judea and they've, that they're not speaking Hebrew anymore and maybe they're speaking Aramaic, but a lot of them have become Hellenized because after Alexander the Great comes in at the uh, end of the fourth century BCE, so like 325 ish, uh, he makes everything like Greek, right? He wants everything to become Greek. And so that's why we, when I was talking about the translation being into Greek in the third century, we're talking about 50, 75, 100 years later, after Alexander has brought this Greek influence into, into the world, well, now we need a Bible in Greek, potentially because people are losing Hebrew. And so, and they're, uh, that's not, they, they can't read the Hebrew text or uh, an Aramaic, even an Aramaic translation of it. They, they, they're Greek speakers, so they need a Greek Bible. It'd be very much uh, anyway. So that that's what happens in the third century, and then this this translation seems to catch on like wildfire and go all over the place, and it makes its way into the New Testament because that's the Bible that many people were reading at the time. Um, it was it just it's what there was. And, uh, you could think about the King James Bible. How for a long time, when you qu quoted the Bible in English, what did you cite? King James. So everybody did right. And uh, that's not so much the case anymore, but for a long time, that, that was kind of just the, the, the cultural practice because that was what was there. And so this is the same thing kind of in, in, an, in an analogous way to the Septuagint. Uh, it was the Bible that was around at the time. And so that's what the New Testament authors seem to be using. And so then what should we not be looking to that document rather, or in, in conjunction with, I should say, the the Septuagint, uh, so this is sort of the Septuagint in conjunction with the Hebrew, the Hebrew text, because the Septuagint might have something to say that the Hebrew text does or does not have to say, and it's the document that they're working with. Yeah, does does that does that help? Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly what I wanted. Okay, so hey, chat, subscribing to our YouTube channel allows us to help our watchers understand the Bible better. Thanks to your help, we have already reached thousands of people in their walk with Christ. If you'd like to help further our efforts. Tap the subscribe button, which will allow us to reach even more people. You forgot to tell them to turn on bell notifications. Wait, they have to subscribe and click a bell now? In your, in your dissertation, you talked about Exodus 21, 15 to 17, and it's changing meaning after translation. Could you explain that difference for us? Let's just back up and get kind of a, a macro picture really quick here, um, just so I can make sure everyone's following along so you don't necessarily have cues and all that kind of thing. I'm working in Exodus. We're talking about a translation in the the 300s BCE uh, in Egypt after this Hellenization has occurred, like I said, and they're bringing the, 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 the Hebrew is being translated to Greek. We're now in Exodus. Moses and Pharaoh, they've done all their stuff. They're out of Egypt and uh, they're going up Mount Sinai. And then there's this section of laws. The Ten Commandments happen. And then it's suddenly this big section of kind of case laws that occur and these case laws uh you know if your ox does this then do that if your slave does this then do that if somebody does this then do that if then kind of thing and th that's what we're in the middle of here and something crazy happens uh in the translation in my estimation that i think is is really noteworthy so if you take a law for example like uh exodus 21 15 you have uh, essentially this anyone who strikes father or mother will be put to death that's what the hebrew says and then in verse 17, which is actually verse 16 in the Septuagint, but it doesn't matter. Uh, anyone who curses father and mother will be put to death. So the same uh, punishment for two kind of parental laws and the, the Hebrew behind uh, will be put to death is the exact same. And there's nothing in the context that would distinguish these. There's nothing. These Everyone agrees. They both mean the same thing. Is put to death. That's the Hebrew. In the Greek, you've got... Anyone who strikes father or mother uh, will be put to death. So thanato, thanatusto, which is just a, a Greek way of doing it. And then in verse 17, you've got anyone speaking ill of father or mother. And then it, it changes the phrase there. And it's uh, thanato, teleftato. And like in, by, by death, um, let him meet an end or something like that. 
Um, and so what I've argued in, in my, my recent JSCS article, and then also my dissertation and then my upcoming monograph as well, is that this phrase is actually, it doesn't have the same meaning as Thanatos, Thanatos though. So one is the death penalty, but the other one, 2217, anyone cursing or speaking ill of father or mother, it's not put to death. It's uh, like, uh, will meet an untimely demise. They'll meet their end. And the idea is actually that it's an imprecation. So it's like, let them meet their end. Um, anyone who does this, like, bad on you. Like, no good. You shouldn't be doing that. And the thing is, in uh, Greek law at the time, it's very common for an imprecation to be the punishment. So for us, we go, what kind of law is that, right? You, cursing father or mother, uh, and then bad on you. And like, what? why would that, That why would anyone even in, uh, make a law like that? But that, that's because that's our view of law. For them, an imprecation was a punishment. It was, it was saying like, you've done something wrong here and like may the, the forces out there do something to you. And so it's a different phrase and it, it means something different. But even though the Hebrew text is actually the exact same. So it's, it's an in, intentional departure, in my opinion, from the Hebrew text. And now we have, in one case, striking parents is de the death penalty, which the Septuagint agrees with. But... Uh, the, the cursing parents, it's, it's, a, it's not the death penalty, it's an imprecation. And so it's, it's almost do not put them to death now. And so the obvious question that would arise from that, um, which we can get to actually, I'd, I'd like to let you respond if you have any questions about that or, or comments or uh, if I can clarify something for you. Oh, no, I was just hoping you get more into the significance. Yeah. So this particular translation, I think, and now this is probably more of the I don't want to say theoretical, but uh, there's 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 a bit of conjecture or a bit of because um, uh, there's a bit of a hypo hypothesis that is is difficult to prove here because law in Ptolemaic Egypt there are there's patchwork and uh, to it and we don't know everything for sure. But uh, you, I made a case that law at the time would have been greatly influenced by the laws of the Greeks in the century prior and um, of the, the legal values of those who have come in. And the Greeks really did want to push their own morality and their own legal values um, in some respects. And they did change things to match up with their legal values in some respects. And that's not completely true. A lot of things they left people to do to their own devices. But when it comes to the death penalty, it seems like that was a thing that was brought uh, that was particularly uh, Hellenized, and uh, you ha you would have have to go to the Greeks for the death penalty to be, to be enacted. And what was worthy of the death penalty um, was very much um, it, it was very important to to the Greeks. And so my claim then is that the translator, this Jewish uh, scribe of some sort, they knew uh, Greek values here, and Greek legal values would not. Uh, suggests the death penalty for cursing or speaking ill of a parent that was beyond their their legal values and so the translator knows that and goes oh man this doesn't work with the way the greeks do things and i'm not sure this works with the way jews might even be doing things at the time or thinking of things and so the change is essentially made and so it no longer has the death penalty it's just an imprecation because of the competing legal values at the time even though the translator knew what the hebrew text said um, and so that's, uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, that, that's kind of what's going on. It, it, is, it should be said as well that uh, Jewish people at the time, we know from other documentation, were very Hellenized in Egypt. So they're they're, they were legally Hellenized in that they were very much relying on Greek law and uh, in their practices, and even maybe to the exclusion of what they, the, the Hebrew text or Hebrew laws that they might have inherited said so they are already doing this to a degree and it seems like it's being now codified in their own text in their sacred their sacred bible right which is a, which is i understand a, a kind of a shocking thing to say but uh, and you you know this because you've read a bit of my work it gets even more shocking because this this verse uh anyone speaking ill of father or mother uh will meet an untimely demise uh, that appears in the new testament on, on the lips of jesus and so he cites this changed version, which is a bit of a uh, an interesting thing to start thinking about. Totally. Okay. So yeah, as you mentioned, uh, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus cited it in Mark seven nine ten, 
also, which is paralleled in Matthew 5, 4, 5, 15, 4, but he didn't use the actual Hebrew. Matthew and Mark both have cited the Greek Septuagint. It seems odd that an all-knowing God like Jesus will be citing the Greek Septuagint, you know, if it wasn't the actual Old Testament. So can you talk about that? Yeah, so it's, it's a difficult issue. And I could probably back up and kind of give myself a little, uh, a little more leg room here when, when, when think for when we think about law and in the Old Testament law, because what the translator did, th- there an argument could be made that uh, law in the Old Testament is not meant to be seen as a kind of here's exactly if if a then b every single time. If you do this, you get that every single time. Uh, there's a growing understanding in Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern scholarship that uh, that asserts that the way they viewed case, uh, law codes like this, like the Covenant Code, like the the, the, ex, the laws in Exodus we're talking about, would have been more would have not been a practical authority. So the practical authority is if X, if you do X, then you get Y um, every time. Oh, but rather, a, that's a practical authority, but an epistemic authority would be something different, would be that this is a way to think about this. Um, and it's not saying that this is what you do every single time, but rather it's giving you a framework, like a wisdom framework for how to approach a particular moral issue or a legal issue. And so it's up to a judge to decide what to do. Um, a judge can use this as an aid to, to, to make a, a ruling in a particular uh, case. But it doesn't mean that it's the, what needs to be happening every single time, and so that's that, so an epistemic authority, wisdom, legal reasoning versus a practical authority, um, kind of statutory law. You do this this exact thing every single time. So it's a different perspective of law, I think, in um, the ancient Near East and in Exodus. And so th- take that, and then let's we're going to bring that, and I'm going to shelve it for a second, but we'll come back to it. Um, as we talk about Jesus, because I think it could help us in the end as we talk about this issue. But again, yes, Jesus does cite the changed law. Uh, Mark 7, uh, 9 and 10 would be good to look at, and the parallel in Matthew 15, 4. Now, there's there's a few problems here. There's a few ways to approach this. So one is Jesus really did just cite the... The, the Septuagint version, and perhaps Jesus was teaching in Greek, and this is the and that and that's it. It's the changed version. Um, for some people, they might go, "Great, Jesus didn't affirm the death penalty here. That's awesome." But at the same time, um, we need to be careful because there are some principles of exegesis and of um, approaching the Gospels and the words of Jesus that need to be taken into mind before we can really come to a definitive conclusion here. For one, we don't know uh, what language Jesus was teaching in. Was he teaching in Aramaic? And did he cite the law in Hebrew and Aramaic? Did he teach in Greek? So perhaps he was teaching in um, in, in, in Aramaic and, in, and citing in Hebrew or something like that. And really, it's just Mark and then Matthew by um, influence of Mark who have put Greek words in the mouth of Jesus. And they put the version of the Septuagint in his mouth because... That's the version everybody was using. Like I said earlier, like a, a huge percentage of the New Testament quotations are from the Septuagint. So it, it's possible that Jesus did cite the law in its Aramaic Hebrew form. But then what we just have in front of us is whatever the, the, the version of the Bible that everyone was using at the time. And so in that way, he didn't affirm no death penalty here. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it. It's also possible that the meaning that I am getting at um, from the third century BCE, where it was influenced by Greek law at the time, and the translator seems to be um, accommodating to that, it's it's possible that over 300 years, that meaning kind of phased out, and people just went, oh yeah, you know, it says thanato, teleftato, that, we- that weird kind of phraseology, but what you really need to understand here is the death penalty. And so then Jesus might have just, you know, <coughs> excuse me, he might have, uh, and the rest of the community might have just understood that phrase to still mean the death penalty, even though originally, way back when, it didn't mean that. It, it had changed to an imprecation rather than the death penalty. So those are things to consider as well. Um, and you can make, I make arguments uh, or 
suggestions either way, given a few things we know about the first century that we don't, don't and other texts that are going on and stuff about the, the language data. But uh, we don't need to get into that right now. Uh, when you said all knowing, uh, Jesus being all knowing, I think, sorry, just one second. <clears throat> There's this cold going around in my house here. <clears throat> when you say Jesus being all knowing and citing a law that doesn't correspond to the Hebrew text, I mean, for one, we could think about that idea of an epistemic authority again. If Jesus is citing the law according to its original intent, which I think would have been not a practical but an epistemic authority, really it's the principle then behind the law that counts, whereas the punishment and exactly how it works out um, was not the point in that it's supposed to tell you a value in that you're supposed to take care of and not diminish the social standing and social uh, and give social protection to those who take care of you growing up. And there could be sev severe ramifications for not doing that. Um, and if that's kind of the, the, the spirit of the law, so to speak, then um, it wouldn't really matter which version Jesus actually cited because that's not the point of law. Um, at the same time, I take Jesus to be a human. Um, he, he's the God man. And so if he's human, fully human, like you and I sitting here are fully human, um, then he is bound to the culture and time and place that he's at. And um, the idea of an omniscient or all-knowing Jesus, I think would need to, in my opinion, um, it, it might be a good idea to, to, to put a, an asterisk on that and say, well, yes, but in what way did he have omniscience? And I think it's as it, as we would have knowledge um, beyond ourselves, which should be from God. God can give Jesus things that he didn't know because he's depending on God the Father to for all things. And uh, so he God can impart him knowledge um, in certain situations, which is what we see in the New Testament. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means that he has every single fact about every text critical issue and uh, Alex uh, Septuagint. Um, hermeneutic and inter interpretive trajectory in mind that has ever existed from the Septuagint to Aramaic versions to Deuteronomy, like, like everything, all of human knowledge, his brain would blow up. Like we just couldn't do that, right? You can't do that. Human, a human brain couldn't do that in my opinion. And so I see it more on this kind of, maybe it's like a, a kenosis kind of version of Christology where Jesus is, has emptied himself of some d divine attributes in the sense of he's not um um, making use of them outside of his relationship as a human with God the Father. And so that's one way of viewing it. So not everyone agrees with my Christology there, and that's fine. Um, we can all talk about these things, and we can have different views of them. Um, that's kind of how I see things. So it, it, in that way, the omniscience issue and him citing a law that might not exactly correspond to what we see in the Hebrew text is, is not a particular issue to me, either that or viewing it in the epistemic authority kind of way of, uh, of viewing ancient Near Eastern law. But... Uh, yeah, that that that's 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 one way to to think about it. Uh, another thing that we could consider here is uh, that Jesus isn't teaching in Greek, um, and what does that say about you know like the all of these other quotations that are being put on his lips? And what's interesting is that in the stu in, in kind of the, some of the studies that have been done on Jesus' site, like directly citing the old testament it's most often the Ele the, the septuagint lxx is another way of putting it so what what does that say if it's not just here it's elsewhere that the, the the septuagint is being put on the lips of jesus i mean i'm not then the only one who's in trouble in hot water here it's it's everyone because this is this is what jesus seems what seems to be happening in the gospels i i think we also probably don't need to be so strict about like exact words of Jesus because when you compare gospels, they're not always verbatim. Um, one way of seeing how Jesus said something, another way of seeing how Jesus said something. And if we were, if they're, if they're make, making their, their statements of, or they're giving Jesus speech as from something that was Aramaic beforehand um, or his teaching in Aramaic, like it's already really difficult to kind of do a one-to-one -one there. So it, there, there's a lot of freedom and we see that kind of freedom in the literary genres of the time. So historians allow for wiggle room. Historians can add words and phrases, even speeches sometimes. Um, and we see this in like Roman bio biographers and uh, historians. 
Uh, we also see this kind of thing in uh, in the more ancient uh, Near East, where uh, history is not just told for like a video recording, but rather for exhortation. Uh, it's important for the document to be teaching something. Um, I, I've just been recently, um, as a kind of side tangent here, uh, I've just been recently going through uh, Joshua Berman's inconsistency in the Torah, and he makes some comparisons between the Kadesh inscription, this kind of inscription from the 12th, uh, 1200s BCE, uh, around the same time as one of the views of, for when the Exodus happens, and then compares that to the Song of the Sea, and um, the, the, the and also the material just so that's Exodus 15, this big song about uh, getting out of the Exodus, and then the the, lit, the narrative portion before that, and he makes a pretty interesting comparison that um, th- there's like a lot of parallels between this. So it might uh, the the Song of the Sea and the, the narrative before might actually be um, kind of riffing on uh, Egyptian propaganda materials, and then uh, what happens there is that you can see that some of like the contradictory element contradictory elements in the Exodus narrative are kind of the same kind of contradictory elements you find in the Kadesh inscription, but they're actually based out of like the genre that is kind of highlighting one area, highlighting another, the same event from another perspective, highlighting it from another perspective. And if you, you're not supposed to try and sync them, it's not part of the literary genre of the time. It's more a part of this exoter- ex, um, exhortation and kind of um, not in the negative pejorative sense of pr- propagandistic, but propagandistic, uh, uh, portrayal of uh this iconic event that happened battle that happened um so the same is the same this is just the way they wrote in the ancient world and so i don't think we need to be too worried about it in my opinion it's uh it's a way of for us and those who want to take the bible seriously and hold a like maybe a high view of inspiration or something like that i think it's where your high view needs to be and you need to place it there is what is the genre of, of 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 document you're reading and what would the author agree with um, when it comes to the parameters of that genre? Because that is where we then identify like the truth claim and the teaching claim of the author, not in some other standard that we've made ourselves or that we from the 21st century would impose upon the text. But this is this is a really long answer to a question you gave. Um, is there anything else like did, anything else you want to add, or do you do you have any questions about that? Well, I mean, you mentioned uh, Jesus not being all knowing, the possibility of it, and I mean, we kind of see that when Jesus says nobody knows the day or the hour, and you know, it also says that he grew in wisdom and stature. It's like, well, I mean, if he grew, then it seems like he wouldn't know something before that. So, I mean, it makes sense, and. Um, I mean, if that's what the Bible says, then we should go for it. Um, But nothing else besides that. Um, uh, I lost my place here. Oh, I just wanted wanted to read uh, the specific passage, actually. Uh, Just the video, and then I'll edit it later. But um, so, yeah, Mark Mark 7, 9 to 10 says, And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. So could you talk about specifically uh, which part of that verse is the one that is in Exodus? Yeah, it's just that second part. Anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. That's a citation of Exodus 21, 17. And what does the actual uh, Exodus twenty one seventeen say? So, in the Hebrew, it says anyone who curses father or mother will be put to death. In the Greek translation, my argument is it says anyone who curses father or mother um, should meet an untimely end or bad on them, like an imp- a curse, mm. not an actual call to the death penalty. And that version is the one that gets cited in the New Testament. But New Testament translations are going to say put to death because it they haven't taken into account this new research that I've been doing that I've done. And so it, this is brand new stuff. And so it, it'll have to be talked about. I, I think at least well, in what way should this be rendered? Should it be understood? It should it still say death penalty here or not. Um, if it originally didn't mean the death penalty, like, and I gave some other arguments why it could have changed back to the death penalty or could be understood as the death penalty at the time of Jesus. But um, my research would say that that's actually a mistranslation in the Bible, in the New Testament, then by, I think, all translators, um, because they haven't done their due uh, diligence in going back to what the Septuagint text was actually saying in its original context. And so, uh, so again, it's a hairy issue, and there's a lot of things um, that I already mentioned that that go into it, but it's that second part, um, uh, to be put to death, that's the, 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 
the point of contention? Does that is that what the Septuagint text actually said? That's very fascinating. I didn't I didn't realize that. Okay, uh, so another interesting passage you mentioned was Exodus twenty two eighteen, which the Greek translator pretty much like completely changes the meaning. Apparently, can you talk about that? Yeah. So this one, uh, this one has. Uh, I'm really interested to get some pushback from the scholarly scholarly community on this one because uh, it's a big claim uh, and. Yeah, it, it's it, th- it. This hasn't been published. It's in my my monograph that's hopefully coming out soon, and it's been it's done its rounds privately with with. So this was in my in my dissertation, and it was with um, my supervisor and a bunch of other people. They read it, and most people said, "Yeah, uh, this is this is this seems to be right, and this is really interesting." Um, but anyways, uh, that's all, all that to say. I'm giving myself an out here because I I want people to contest this on the fine points uh once it's out there but so exodus twenty two eighteen is a law about bestiality uh it's twenty two nineteen in the septuagint and it says anyone laying with a animal uh, will be put to death in the hebrew in the greek uh, i make a different claim because it doesn't it doesn't exactly seem to say that and so that word any at the beginning so in hebrew you've got the word kol and that it's not in Hebrew, that word is not gendered in that kol could be masculine, feminine. Um, it, 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 it just depends on uh, it's not gendered. OK, uh, should, I should that back up. It's just not gendered in Greek. However, um, the word any uh, it, it is gendered. And by gendered, I mean, like it, in German, you got you got air, er, d, das and le, la in French, like that kind of thing. Like a, English is not like this, but um there's there's a grammatical gender to specific words and and terms, and so in in Greek, uh, pas the typical word for any uh, that would be masculine, and then pan is neuter, and they have different meanings. So kol Hebrew, all not gendered, and when you translate, you got to choose, pas, which is going to refer to humans, or pan, and pan in the the neuter referring to either animals, abstract concepts, or uh, inanimate objects. And so the weird thing here is if you thought, if we thought that the translator thought, if the translator wanted to refer to humans, he would go pas. He'd go pas, anyone laying with animals uh, will be put to death and pas will refer to humans, but it doesn't. He has, has pan. So any neuter thing laying with animals will be put to death. And so when he says pan, pan couldn't refer to humans. And there are some like arguments I know that could be made against my claim for grammar here. And I, I talk about them in my dissertation and we're not going to get into them here because it's way beyond um, this kind of discussion. Um, but pa, this is very strange because this doesn't happen elsewhere in the Septuagint. It's just suddenly right here. Everywhere you get pas and if, with the coal is either pas or um Pasa or pan, like these are different genders depending on um, the context. And uh, here it's obviously humans. So why did he translate with a neuter, which makes it into animals? And so then my claim, um, and this is taking me a little while to get here. So I'll just, this is the claim. The claim is it says any animal laying with your domesticated flock will be put to death. And so it's not any human, it's any animal. And then the question you, you have is, well, Okay, that's not about bestiality. No, it's not. It seems to be about animal husbandry. And so it's the idea that any animal that's not part of your domestic flock, so probably any wild animal that comes in and lays with your domestic flock, you're going to kill them. And so the, it's not even about bestiality anymore. Now it's about animal husbandry, which is which is crazy. Uh, that's That's just not what the Hebrew text says. And so undoubtedly you'll ask me, what on earth, why did that happen, right? And I'm sure you're wondering why that happened. I am. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems in my claim is that Greeks and Egyptians, so the two kind of predominant other cultures at the time where the translation was happening, they didn't legislate against sexual um, deviancy. I'll just use that term. Um, they, 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 there wouldn't be laws for this kind of um odd behavior, sexual behavior. They'd have laws against some stuff like adultery and and, and and things of that matter, but not not bestiality. And so the translator faced with this problem, can we really have a law saying here that 
we have to kill people who for committing bestiality. That just doesn't jive with the culture we're in and the law legal system we're in. So he does this little tweak, just a gender tweak from past to pawn, but it changes the meaning of the law. And it's not, it doesn't say the same thing anymore. And, uh, it's it's a totally different law now, and I mean, how would we feel if someone just came up to us and just, or when they were translating our Bible, just suddenly changed the the meaning entirely, like something like in, in this way, uh, that it might be uncomfortable. And I think it potentially could have been uncomfortable in, in the translator's context, should his audience pick up on what happened. But it seems to be kind of the most extreme example of changing these laws to be more adapted to the context in which the translator was in. So you might judge the translator right or wrong on this one, but it's a, it's a crazy example. And and this one doesn't find its way into the new Testament. So we don't have to, to work to, to deal with it that way, but it's, it's a, it's a really interesting one that I'm wait, I'm waiting to get, to get more feedback on once it gets out there and people can argue back and forth with me about the, the deep grammar and uh, some of the, the, the claims I make, but as it stands, it's uh it's it's a it's a pretty pretty crazy translation, but uh, maybe I could point to another agreed upon change by the translator, um, an, an odd translation choice that's made elsewhere in the same co- in the same section of laws, and that's in twenty two twenty seven, um, or in twenty two twenty eight in the Septuagint. So this one no one disagrees with, and so you noted how I just said it's just one tiny little word that was changed from pas to pan in that last law and it's it's the both both words that mean any kol means any in hebrew uh pan means any in greek it's just the slight change even though it's basically staying close like it's superficially staying close same thing happens and this is agreed upon in 22 27 it says in the hebrew you will not curse god um and that god word is elohim the translator doesn't say that the translator says you will not curse gods or not revile gods as in multiple deities here and so that's that's not the same thing but 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 see how the translator stayed really close it's like superficially elohim god elohim can also be translated gods so the translator stays close but it's a superficial closeness because the meaning is no longer the same now it's saying respect kind of all the deities that are out there not saying worship them or anything but i think it's saying just don't revile them like show due respect that's not what the Hebrew, t- I, I don't think, at least that's, and most, I think, I don't know anyone who disagrees. I mean, perhaps there's someone out there. That's not what the Hebrew text says. So it's just a slight little tweak, but a different meaning. And the, the translator seems to be doing this in a bunch of places in, uh, particularly in, in the covenant code, which is the section of laws that we've been talking about in Exodus 21 to approximately like 23 in 19. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's happening elsewhere and people agree. I've just kind of pointed out new examples that hadn't been seen before because they're just, again, just a little tweak, but the little tweak does a lot. It's a little tweak from the death penalty, like uh, with uh, put to death. And then suddenly it's by death, let them meet their end. It's like, well, that's kind of the same thing, but it's not, it's a different meaning. And uh, it be uh, pass and pawn very close to, to coal, but it's, it's a different meaning, even though it's so superficially close. And so these are some of the crazy things I found, and my monograph gets into a bunch of them, um, which I which I, I hope will kind of push people to some to, to excitement and to debate, and we can talk about this kind of thing in in the field of Septuagint studies and elsewhere, because it like I said, it affects uh, not only Septuagint but also the New Testament. Uh, how do we understand what Jesus said then? Because it's one of the, I think it's probably my claim would make this one of the biggest changes out of any of the laws that are in Jesus' mouth in the New Testament. Because a lot of the times the Septuagint stays close, but I'm saying it's actually almost the opposite meaning in that in that one than the Hebrew text, which doesn't happen very often um, with, with the death penalty. And then, uh, yeah, it has ramifications, this work for Second Temple Judaism and how were Jews understanding the law at the time of the translation. And the t- and these are the, the, the spiritual forebears of the New, the, the New Testament uh, uh time period when you have all the Jews in, in the New Testament, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all these. So there, this is tr- tr- interpretation that goes way back that might have um, some some reverberations into this later time period. And it's possible, for example, in uh, with the not cursing father or mother, having just a, a, not the death penalty, but a, an imprecation, a curse, uh, the Pharisees seem to have held this view. And Josephus talks about them not wanting to put people to death just for verbal 
um, reproaching, which is actually coinciding with what I'm claiming about this law in Exodus. So it's just, it's just interesting. I'm not saying there's a direct connection. I'm just saying that it's interesting that you see this kind of same thought developing later on when I'm pointing to it in the third century, um, or at least being attested later on, and I'm pointing to it back in the third century. So, I mean, I mean that, that, that's interesting. Um, we could talk about, if you wanted to, um, kind of more of the, 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 the influence of the Septuagint on the New Testament in like specific examples if we wanted to, or we can move on uh, to something else, but uh, whatever you want to do. Well, I was just going to point out that it's, it's absolutely crazy that, you know, we're 2000-ish years away, and like this is something that is just like brand new and like no one's ever mentioned this before. And it's like, oh, shoot, I was there the whole time. And it's like, what in the world were they trying to think there? And hey, we're discovering new things about the Bible every day. And it's pretty crazy. Um, uh, I was just, uh, I was hoping we could talk about um, Exodus 21, 7 to 11. Does that sound good? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yep. Okay, cool. Let's go for it. Sure. Yeah. So that was another one in, in, in actually this one, I think you've, you picked up on some of my other work elsewhere. This one's not in my, my dissertation uh, formally. It was in my master's thesis, but it's something I'm continuing to develop. It's, it's really interesting. It's this law about uh, a father who tragically has, who gives his daughter as uh, sells his daughter as a slave, uh, seems to be a slave wife. And then she goes to the master and then the master has to provide her with three things. Otherwise, uh, she she can go free without any cost or anything like that. And it says that he's got to give her food, clothing, and uh, probably like right of cohabitation. So sex, like sexual intercourse to, so that she can procreate, have children, have uh, social protection um, at the time. Because she's in a pretty uh, destitute state being a female slave wife. And so we've got these three things, uh, but, but what, and the interesting thing that happens is so you've, in, in the Hebrew, you've got food, clothing, uh, right of cohabitation. In the Septuagint, you've got the necessities, clothing allowance, and right, right of cohabitation. And so it's very subtle again, this slight change, but he says the necessities instead of food, she'er. She'er is the Hebrew for food. And so the question is, what, what, what is going on here? Why is this happening? what I found, and this kind of points again to just how, uh, it's cumulative evidence towards my claim of Greek law being and the Greek legal Hellenization of the text going on here. If you look at marriage contracts from the third, second century, first century, uh, so Greek marriage contracts in Egypt, you'll find in the section on the provisions that the husband has to give to the wife um, or else uh, the marriage can be annulled. Uh, it usually it often starts with, but always includes the the necessities and the clothing allowance. So tadeonda is what you find in the Greek. That tadeonda keton himatismon, that's the Greek, the necessities and the clothing allowance. That phrase is what you find in these marriage contracts. And it seems like the translator has just taken that, copied and pasted, swapped out the word for food in Hebrew and put in the necessities. And so now... It actually reads in line with what uh, a husband has to provide for the wife in the Greek world, in the Greek legal world, not necessarily the, he the Hebrew world. And so it's he's he's updated the law in essence to uh, fit with the the contractual language of the time and even the moral norms and legal norms of the time because the necessities would just mean well what's ever required and agreed upon that a wife should or a husband should provide for his wife in the culture that is, which was the Greek culture at the time. And so that's really interesting. And I mean, I don't know if that's even, if we should say that's not in line with the Hebrew text, because you, you ask yourself, uh, food, clothing, um, right of cohabitation, like that, that doesn't seem like, like there are a lot of other things you could consider there. Like what if he just what if, what if he said, okay, fine, or someone said, fine, we'll do that, but you could sleep outside with the animals, or you're going to work your fingers till they're bloody, or something like that, right? And I, I think that the point of the law was, it was using three items, food, clothing, cohabitation, that summarized, you just need to provide, you actually have to provide what is required, the necessities for, for your wife, otherwise she, she this slave wife can go free. It's supposed to be giving her this kind of catch all or overall protection and so in that way the translator even though 
The translators updated according to Greek uh, terminology and potentially even norms at the time, signaled to those norms that that legal world uh, it might still be in line with what the Hebrew law was getting at, which is interesting because perhaps the translator is viewing things in more of a holistic, with a more holistic approach or a epistemic approach where, you know, what, what was this getting at and how do we fit this into the culture that we're currently living in, still staying in line with its, uh, the thrust of what it was getting at. I'm not saying that's for sure. I'm just saying that that's, it's interesting to do that as kind of a thought experiment that, 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 that could be what, what's happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I, like, I, like I said earlier on, people are, we, we, we have come to a, there's a, a growing consensus that ancient Near Eastern law. So you look at something like the code of Hammurabi or, um, there's a whole host of other laws that you that you have with their Hittite laws and stuff like that. They, they the reason we say that they don't seem to function as practical authorities but are epistemic authorities instead is because uh, in court cases we don't actually see laws being cited, and so uh, you don't see the code laws of Hammurabi, Hammurabi being uh, okay. Uh, here's what he said. Let's just do that. It just doesn't happen. It seems like there's judicial discretion going on with potential influence from these things. And the funny thing about the Bible is that we don't actually see this, the same thing, or, or we don't see laws being used in the, the, the narratives of the text in judicial cases. Uh, you don't see the Bible citing uh, Exodus, the, the laws in Exodus somewhere in the in Kings. Uh, like so, let's say Solomon is doing some sort of case, you don't see him bringing uh, citing a law a law code because they were viewing things again. I think as more of an epistemic authority rather than a practical authority. And so there was a judge who was mediating legal wisdom based on this inherited tradition behind them um, that they that had come with them. And so uh, in that way, I think it's just a different way of viewing law. And I think perhaps the, 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 the Septuagint and these laws in Exodus could kind of point us in that direction, even if it might not be for sure that that's what's going on. It's interesting that these kind of my study, my studies and my research kind of coincide with this kind of growing um, uh discussion about uh, ancient Near Eastern law and how it functioned in a different way and how they had a different framework than we do in the modern context. So you wouldn't consider that figurative language, right? Because I mean, it's using one language to kind of encapsulate the meaning of another, another idea. But that wouldn't, that wouldn't be considered figurative, right? Well, it's just taking into a, like, it's taking into account the, the genre and what the phrase was getting at. So it's not giving you um, a direct uh, tr a translation uh, of the exact words there. But if the intent overall was to say anything that's required, it's just getting at the meaning rather than like a strict formal one-to-one -one, uh, equivalency. Just to kind of emphasize then to your audience, um, and if they've stuck around this long, you're interested in Septuagint. So <laughs> this is the, so the, 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 here's some some juicy stuff for you. Uh, now that you've been patiently sitting through my my mundane research, <laughs> uh, so it's just stuff like let's say Hebrews one six. Uh, in, in Hebrews one six, it talks about uh, it, it says uh, when when God brings the firstborn into the world, He says, and let all the angels of God worship Him, and so that's a citation from Deuteronomy 32, 43. However, if you go back to, or if you go into your Old Testament and you look up the Hebrew text, you won't see that verse there because it's not there in, in the, the, the traditional Hebrew text that we have, uh, the Masoretic text. And we, we could get into talking about that if you want, but that's the one that well, we, we base most of our, our translations off of and the Dead Sea Scrolls and stuff are, are being incorporated into that tradition now. And in fact, in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls do uh, attest to and let all the angels of God worship him being there. And guess what? So does the Septuagint. And so in this case, in Hebrews 1, 6, you've got uh, the author of Hebrews citing a text, a Septuagint text that says something that's not in our Old Testament in the version, the, the, the tradition that we've received but in fact does seem to have been a more ancient reading. And so something happened in the course of the MT that this was lost, but the Septuagint's been faithfully there 
all along, just and uh, having this rendering for us, and the Book of Hebrews too, showing us, and the Dead Sea Scrolls now, that this was actually a part of the original text. And so you have to say at that point, the Septuagint's quite important because it's pointing us back to an earlier text. And so that's one way. That's a, that's a kind of a text critical um, perspective of looking at the Septuagint. There's also some interpretive stuff. So uh, a really good one that I love pointing to is Acts 15, 17. And uh, so it's, there's this, uh, you've got the Jerusalem council and they've gathered to try and figure out what do we do with Gentiles being um, incorporated into this Jesus movement, right? And so then you've got James getting up and he cites uh, the book of Amos, but he cites it from the Septuagint and, and he cites this verse, uh, I think it's uh, Amos, oh, what is it? Um, 9-11. 9-11, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so he says, uh, and here's the, here's the, uh, the Septuagint version. And after these things, I will return and, and build up again, the tent of David that has fallen and the parts of it that had been torn down. I will build up again and I will restore it. And so the rest of, and here's the key point humanity. And so, uh, humanity there in, in Amos, in the Hebrew, it's Edom, Edom, but the translator, uh, has uh, Adam it seems to be translating based on Adam. Um, so it's the same. If you looked at it in Hebrew, uh, it would look almost the exact same. There's just one little potential letter that might even not, um, could have been rep not um, visually represented. Just uh, it, you would have just assumed it. It's possible. Um, so it's very similar. And so the question is, did the, uh, the, the translator or sorry, uh, James is citing this. So the rest of humanity uh, which is Adam may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from old. So that very much that the rest of humanity, Adam would come to God very much supports what's going on with the Gentiles. All nations might come to God. And that's, he's drawing that on that from a Septuagint text that seems to be different or at odds with the Hebrew text, which is Edom. So the rest of Edom may seek the Lord. So the question, so what, so what do you do with this? But I wonder if this is a case where the Septuagint translator is really picking up on a like biblical theological motif in that Edom becomes, and especially throughout time. So even as time goes on in um, the, the, the second temple period, Edom becomes figurative of um, everyone outside of Israel. They're all, they're a symbol for everyone outside of Israel. And so when the translator goes, Oh, I see Edom in the text, perhaps the translator did see Edom in the text here. He went, Oh, you know what? Theologically Edom represents humanity. And so I'm going to use humanity here. And then, so what happens in, with James is he goes, yeah, right. That's great. And so that theological interpretation of uh, Edom into Adam or into humanity, because that's what Edom represents in Amos and throughout the history of Israel and their interactions with Edom, um, then it actually makes a lot of sense uh, for it to be uh, ad, uh, for humanity re being the translation of Edom. And so there's this cool kind of theological thing already going on in the Septuagint. And then James is drawing on that thing that's already gone on in the Septuagint probably, and has now applied that to his context where the Gentiles are coming in. And so in that way, it's not really a, a, not a faithful representation of the Hebrew, but it's kind of this through line theological interpretation of, uh, of what's going on in the Hebrew Bible uh, when it comes to Edom representing humanity. Uh, but there's other things too. And uh, can I go to a different example? Go for it. Yeah. All you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the vocabulary of the new Testament is, is highly influenced by the Septuagint. And uh, I think uh, oftentimes that uh, the New Testament authors are, uh, they can be understood better when we see how they're drawing on Septuagint language and how that could kind of affect uh, or can give us clues as to how their argument should be perceived and how the words should be understood. And so I'm going to open Pandora's box and I'm definitely not going to try and um, uh, avoid the chaos that's coming out here. Uh, but example would be in, for Romans three, when, when it talks about uh, the, the, the righteousness of God and it talks about, uh, ne but now the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith uh, for faith. And so there's a lot of huge debate that goes on here. But what's interesting is that 
and this is not me who's noticed this. This is an article by Richard Hayes, I think, at the end in the eighties. Uh, he notes that Psalm one hundred forty three is quoted uh, that uh, no flesh will be justified before Him, and that's at, at, at right in the middle of of Romans three. It says that by works of the law, no flesh will be justified before Him, and so. Paul cites or alludes very heavily to Psalm 143 there. But the thing is, if you go back in the text, you can see that other phrases from Psalm 143 are being weaved in. You've got the, the, the righteousness of God, the dikosune theu. You've got the truth of God, aletheia theu. You've got the faithfulness of God, the pistis theu, which I think could be Paul's own way of rendering. This is totally another thing of, of Elos from the Septuagint. I'm going to pass by that. Anyways, so you've got this language, uh, that from Psalm 143 undergirding the all of Romans 3, and I think it helps us to understand that he's kind of framing the argument in Romans 3, which and the argument in Romans 3 being that Jews, um, they, they there's nothing you could that they could depend on, there's no external thing to say, uh, this thing or this thing or this thing is the reason why I'm in a right relationship with God because no flesh will be justified before him, and the only thing they could depend on is the dikaiosune theu. And the question is, in New Testament studies, what does that mean, dikaiosune theu, the righteousness of God? But if Psalm 143 is the guiding, is the 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 the, the, the lighthouse guiding us, and it's giving us these different ter terms appearing throughout Romans 3, and he culminates the argument with it, then we should go back to Psalm 143 to understand what dikaiosune theu means. And it's right there in the context of Psalm 143, and he says, God, save me in your righteousness. Uh, save me in your truth. And the point of God's righteousness there is that it's his saving power. It, for God to save someone in his righteousness, is, his righteousness is almost equivalent to God coming in and just saving you. And so the Dikai in Psalm 143 means God's saving power. And so then why not, if that's the, 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 the kind of the, the substructure of, of, of Paul's argument in Romans 3, uh, why does Dikaiosune Theu not mean that in Romans 3? And so when you get to that pivotal point that everyone, the verses that everyone always quotes, quotes, but now the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law and prophets, the righteousness of God needs to be interpreted through the lens, lens of Septuagint vocabulary from Psalm 143, which he just cited and has been undergirding his argument before, and the righteousness of God in that context means God's saving power. And so in that way, it actually helps the Septuagint, I think, and I know people will argue against this. I think it helps us to understand things like Paul's arguments and the and um, the vocabulary he uses and even the substructure of his arguments and and how you can see he's based Psalm, as one, Psalm 143 as the paradigm through which he's making an argument, which is there's nothing, no flesh will be justified before him, um, is the statement in Psalm 143. And he's proving that with respect to works of the law being these particular markers that people, Jewish Judaizers would have uh, wa uh, wanted others to do to say, yes, this what th yes, faith plus this thing will make you in a right relationship with God. But, but he's saying, no, no, one, not, none of that works. And God's saving power is only by faith, by allegiance to uh, God through Jesus at this point. So, so that's another really interesting one where it's, uh, a more holistic approach to um, the, the Septuagint influencing an entire passage. And uh, I think uh, that one has a lot of weight and I'd recommend people check out Hayes's article um, for, for, for that. Uh, another question could be raised concerning not citations, but allusions. And I'd say allusions are probably just, and we can just briefly touch on this. I know we're going pretty long here and we uh, and it's getting late for, uh, for you. Uh, allusions, I would argue, could be just as important as citations. And so you, you take something like the letter of Philippians. There are no citations, like it is written or scripture, or scripture says or anything like that in Philippians. But you actually find the language of the Septuagint just ri riddled throughout it. And so, uh, for, for example, uh, in Philippians 4.18, Paul says, I've received everything in full and have abundance. I'm well supplied because I received from Epaphroditus, excuse me, <clears throat> what you have sent, a fragrant offering. The Greek is osmein evodias, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So fragrant offering, osmein evodias. Guess what? That is, that's not his own phraseology. That's from Exodus 29, 18. 
where it says that you'll bring like uh, this this lamb uh, on the altar as a, a burnt offering to the Lord as or for a osmane evodias, a fragrant offering. And so he's using the language of the Septuagint and of this cultic terminology, but he's not directly citing it. But it's a, there's a theological point there because he's almost like he sees the church as this temple, like the body of Christ being the, the temple of God. They were being built into the, into the temple of God. And he's like a priest who's taking this offering and he's offering it as this fragrant offering, the Osmane Evodias. And uh, so he's, it's, it's, it's now creating this kind of matrix of um, symbols and ideas from the Old Testament based on just an allusion to the Septuagint in Exodus, to the cultic terminology that you find there. And you, you see uh, other allusions in the book of Philippians, like uh, in 119, he says, for I know that this will turn out for deliverance. And that's actually an allusion to Job 13, 16, where Job is also just kind of contemplating his relationship with God and whether he's going to be deli- uh, um, saved or not or hurt, or not hurt, harm, not harm. Whereas Paul is also going, yeah, same thing. What's going on with me here? And so there might be like this, the subtle illusion, but it's also drawing on this framework of, am I, Paul's going, am I going to die, not die, live as Christ, die as gain? Like this whole almost like philosophical exploration of what's better of being of, of death and seeing God, like Job wants kind of, and like, it's just interesting. There's these kind of parallels and um, this, this imagery that could evoke another context, but it's not a direct citation. So allusions, they're everywhere. The book of revelation, I, 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 I don't, I'm trying to, I don't want to misspeak here. But it, I, I, won't, I won't speak about its direct citations, but the allusions are just almost un, uh, uncountable because there are, it's, it's contested because there's so many and they're weaving in and out. Um, and there's um, ones that are, are blended citations. And so it's all over the place. And uh, it, you really can't escape it, but it's so theologically and exegetically important to understand that what, what's happening and what John is riff, riffing off of um, in order to understand the book of Revelation better. And that's all just based in illusions. So illusions are, are, are incredibly important. But I've, I've gone on again for a while here. So uh, what, what would you want to, what do you want to talk about next? Or, or is there anything else you want to talk about? Awesome. That's some uh, little bonus content that I, that I didn't expect to get. So that's cool. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's keep going. Let's talk about... Um... Exodus twenty one twenty, uh, you know, the Greek Septuagint appears to add additional words to the text. Can you talk about the difference between those? Yeah, well, let's just do briefly this one because I don't think it's as interesting. Um, it doesn't have as much exegetical or uh, interpretive uh, interest, I think, to probably the majority of people. It's a, it's a really interesting. Uh, it, it's a fascinating one that from from my dissertation. But just uh, in Exodus twenty, it talks about. If a master strikes their slave and the slave dies under their hands, uh, it says in the Hebrew, he will be avenged. The slave will be avenged. In the Greek, it says in a trial, he will be avenged. So it actually adds these words in, in a trial. And then the question then is, well, what's going on? And uh, it's, there's a lot of ways you could kind of view things. But in the Hebrew, it seems like, well, he will be avenged. Well, what does that mean? And commentators think that this phrase, it's not the death penalty exactly, it's a different phrase, but they think that it is referring to the death penalty, but rather it's, um, he will be avenged by judges um, because the there's no kin or anyone to to help the slave who, uh, uh, who are around because the slave might be by themselves or whatever in the community. And so the idea being you will be avenged in a judicial, or by, by judges in a judicial setting and probably with the death penalty. Um, and so that's uh, that's the Hebrew, and so I think the Greek text is just telling you straight out, hey, yeah, in in a judicial set setting, in a trial, he will be avenged. So it's it's taking the implied meaning that he will be avenged by judges for the Hebrew, and just putting it in there in a trial by judges by judges, he will be avenged in the Septuagint. And so it's it's again kind of helping us along, and it's an example where it might be giving. Um, an interpretive rendering that, but it might actually help us understand the Septuagint or the Hebrew text uh, to, a gr- to, to with greater accuracy um, than we would have when we were just kind of left in to fill in the gaps ourselves. But I recognize there's other stuff you could say about this, and there are different ways you could take it. And I have some other ideas about it as well. But uh, I can leave that for people to 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 read the monograph when it comes out. 
Go for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, like, what does this say about the Septuagint? I mean, sure, I would assume that you got a lot of good translations in there, but at the same time, a lot of these are just like different, changing words, adding to it. I mean, I mean, yeah. What does it say about the accuracy of the text? Yeah, this is such a big question. Uh, and we could sit here for weeks and there have been books and books and books talking about the Septuagint as a resource for text criticism of the Hebrew Bible. So taking the Septuagint and going, okay, what was the Hebrew text behind this translation? And is it different than the Hebrew text that we know today and have today? And Emmanuel Tove would be a great um, scholar to point people to, to start talking and thinking about that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I think it depends on the book. So some translators are going to be more rigid in their representation of the Hebrew than others. Some are going to take less interpretive or, or yeah, have less interpretive freedom and cut fewer corners. Let's say uh, that's probably a bad way of putting it. Just, yeah, maybe take less liberties. That's That's probably a better way of saying it. Uh, yeah. So it really depends on the translation because again, it's not a monolithic thing. The Septuagint, there's a bunch of different translations, a bunch of Greek translations that are going on potentially, well, certainly with different reasons behind certain translation choices. Uh, so it's it's a difficult subject. And the thing is, it's it's a, it's an aid. The Septuagint helps us to understand the, the ancient world, understand texts in the ancient world, understand that there were different texts circulating in the ancient world, so di even different Hebrew parent texts. So we, there were, it was a pluriformity of texts in the ancient world where you would have different versions of, let's say, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, so this is a, a pretty big one. Jeremiah in the Septuagint is going to be much shorter and arranged differently than the Masoretic text, of, which is longer um, and arranged differently. And so about a third shorter, a third of the text is not there in the Septuagint version. And it seems to reflect a Hebrew text that didn't have that other stuff. And so what do we do with that? Um, that's, that's, that's difficult. You got it for, how do you view that in light of inspiration? How do you view that in light of the text that we've had? They're, they're difficult things to think about. Uh, same thing with like the David and Goliath story. You can see in Samuel that the Septuagint version is again, shorter. And it seems like there's been another David and Goliath tradition added in to the Masoretic text that wasn't there with the Septuagint uh, in the original or the, the, the Hebrew text that the translation the translator is translating from. Uh, another good one that I am thinking a lot about is the tabernacle in Exodus. Uh, the, in the buildings uh, segment in 35 to 40, chapters 35 to 40, it's very different in the Septuagint than in the Masoretic text. And it seems like the translator is working from a version of the Hebrew text that doesn't exist in our modern Hebrew versions, like almost a, an earlier version that uh, was had done less harmonizing with the other account of tabernacle um, um, materials in earlier in the kind of chapters 25 to 30 ish. And so again, it, it makes you think and it makes you, it gives us a window into the ancient world and the ways that they viewed text, what was going on with the text, sacred text, how there were different things going on. And that's not to say that all like everything's up for grabs here. Like there's a lot of really, like a lot of it is, is, is just the same. And the translations clearly reflects um, the Hebrew text that we know. Um, I've just given you kind of the big examples to kind of throw some cold water on your face. Like, Oh, oh there's more going on here than I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's more complex than I thought. And there's a lot to think about, but it shouldn't it should get people to study and to think and to try and put to, to have grace on someone from 2000 years ago, because they didn't live in the same world we do. We, we have computers, we have uh, Bible software, we've got translations, too many translations, we've got versions, we've got all this history. They didn't they just didn't have that they, to, to make a manuscript is very or, or a copy of uh, a ver uh, whatever Genesis would be very expensive, like days and days and days of wages for one, and it would take time. And so you'd have these, you wouldn't really have your own personal Bible. It would be at the synagogue or in a library, whatever, or a rich person would have some and you would maybe copy down on a little piece of papyrus or something or something you liked. Um, they just, if they lived in a different world than we do. And so uh, respecting that and understanding that it's, it's a lot more complex than we think and that there's, 
a lot going on that we doesn't immediately come to our minds, I think helps us to have a bit of humility in the interpretive process and in looking at the Septuagint and looking at its value and how it's being used in the New Testament. Um, we could just have grace on them and on uh, the world they were in. And it also helps us to have grace on why the New Testament authors are citing the Septuagint because it's probably the version that everyone was using. And so they don't, they don't have the ability to bring up Logos with six different Hebrew texts and versions and say, here you go. You can all look at this. It's no one has that. So they have the version that everyone's using. Let's just cite that one. It's saying the truth about Jesus and let's, let's move on. Um, I think a lot of the time, like th that kind of thing is happening as well. Um, all of this is to say that it's complex uh, and you need to think about it from a host of different angles. Um, the, the Septuagint's a gift that it gives us a window into what it means to have God giving a word, giving text to his to his people, and it, it speaks to the complexities of uh, transmitting a text and, tr and getting the text into another language, into another culture, and into another world. A world different. Uh, the world of a thousand BC is not the same world as Jesus is not the same world as 1080 is not the same world as us right now. Certainly not. They would hardly recognize the world we live in. And so there's some uncertainty, but we can leave room for a very complex God who uh, is leading his people. Um, and he's given us the Septuagint alongside our Hebrew texts and translations to, to help us and to point to all these things that we've been talking about and to, to have, to have things to think about and how people might do, uh, or, and how the New Testament might do exegesis, how we might do exegesis, and how we might rely on the wisdom of the translators as much, or in tandem with uh, the wisdom of the received Hebrew text. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you talking and giving us all that extra info that I didn't even plan on. So that's awesome. Uh, uh, any yeah, thanks, Zach. Any place that you would like uh, to point people to? I mean, you obviously get point some resources, I would assume. Like, do you have like a website or anything like that yet? I don't have a website. Uh, I have Twitter that I barely ever comment on anything on. Uh, Joel F. Koretko. And yeah, I mean, a Facebook page where I'll post once every year. So <laughs> saying here's an article I published or something like that. But other than I should probably have more online presence. I just I I don't really have time and it's not the biggest interest to me. But <laughs> yeah, uh, if you want to check me out or send me an email or something, uh, feel free. I work at Northwest Baptist Seminary. I have an email there. Trinity Western uh, University. I have an email there. Both of those are located in British Columbia, Canada. And yeah, I'd love to hear if anyone has an e a, a comment in an email or a question. I, I'm more than happy to, to chat. Yeah, but you'll also uh, be commenting on our uh, on the comment section because you're an actual fan. So that works out really yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I was saying before we started talking here, I'm not quite sure how I came across your channel, but I've been really interested. There's some good biblical scholars on there. It's great. I think you might maybe you're my first scholar that i've hit up because you commented in the comments so <laughs> uh, yeah well i mean uh, uh ben kilcore's stuff was really good on eden and he like i like i said in the comments he changed my view i think i was i thought about it for a few days uh, i changed my view on uh, the symbolic representation of the holy of holies as it corresponds to eden not to the garden um, in the Genesis narrative. And I went, that's profound. And that totally makes sense because the garden imagery is in the antechamber and the garden is in the east of Eden. And so there's actually this other area further west that is Eden, which is God's land, like God, like almost like the, 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 the numinous, like this beyond. And that's the Holy of Holies. And that's, oh yeah, that's great. What an awesome, what an awesome point. So I, I had to comment on that. Yeah, that's profound, but awesome. All right. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your night, Dr. Kritko, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Zach.